Welcome back to the Fox Den, everyone, a podcast series from West Shore Community College. We are reviewing the winter 2023 book of the semester, Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. This episode covers chapters 19 through 24, where we chat about the book's history and political science with Professor Mike Nagel, chemistry and geology with Professor Sonia Seward, and physics with Professor Joe Grahusky. Hello, I'm Wade James, Professor of Mathematics, and I want to wish Adrienne Balboa a happy birthday. She was born on this day, March 10th, 1950. She would have been 73 years old if she hadn't died between Rocky V and Rocky VI. My name is Mike Nagel, and I teach history and political science, and I think Rocky and Grace would make a great songwriting team. I am Sonia Seward, and I'm the Professor of Chemistry and Geology, And to help you celebrate birthdays even more, 2023 is the 550th birthday of Nicholas Copernicus. My name's Joe Gerhusky, and I teach physics and math here at West Shore, and I dislike roller coasters. My organs prefer to stay where they are, not be shaken around inside my body. In chapter 19, Ryland and Rocky gather a sample of Adrian's atmosphere, hoping to discover an astrophage-eating predator. After retrieving the sample and attempting to leave Adrian's atmosphere, the Hail Mary's fuel tanks are breached, causing the ship to spin out of control. In chapter 20, Ryland stabilizes the Hail Mary, but at the cost of a traumatizing near-death experience for Rocky, Ryland struggles with his own wounds while attempting to nurse Rocky back to health. In Chapter 21, Ryland and Rocky have mostly recovered and resumed the search for an astrophage predator from the sample collected from Adrian's atmosphere. They discover the sample is brimming with life and watch as astrophage are consumed by an amoeba-like creature now known as Talmeba. Then the Hail Mary loses all power. In Chapter 22, Ryland determines that Taumiba have infected the astrophage-filled fuel tanks, rendering the Hail Mary powerless. Ryland repurposes the independently fueled beetles as thrusters to propel the Hail Mary back to the blip A. In Chapter 23, a flashback reveals an explosion at the Astrophage Research Center killed Dubois and his backup engineer. Pressed for time, Strat attempts to strong-arm Ryland to join the crew, but he refuses. In Chapter 24, the Hail Mary continues to travel toward the Blip A, powered by the Beatles. Ryland and Rocky experiment with Taumiba, attempting to breed nitrogen-resistant strains that will survive in the atmospheres of Venus and Three World. One thing that I found interesting about Chapter 19 and Chapter 20 is that there weren't very many flashbacks. It was kind of the action-packed sequence of the story. In chapter 19, Ryland and Rocky are devising a technique to sample Adrian's atmosphere to see if they can find this astrophage-eating bacteria. And the best technique that they come up with is to basically design a gas trap that they're going to lower down into the atmosphere from the Hail Mary on this chain link made of xenonite. And then they're going to close it while it's down in the atmosphere, and then they're going to reel it back up. What did you guys think of extracting a sample from Adrian's atmosphere and the way that they did it? That was one of the things that I would say with that is just the monotony of doing that for two weeks. And so he kind of glosses over that. He says, well, it took us two weeks to do that. And so uh, there wasn't a lot of excitement, you know, just with making those. But it was interesting how they would use a 3D printer to make the molds and then Rocky Uh, was able to make it with the xenonite. As they were making these chains, they would make a certain length and then put them on spools and store them outside of the Hail Mary and then reconnect them as they were lowering the probe into Adrian's atmosphere. One thing that I also found kind of interesting was the approach that the author took in this part of the chapter. I can't remember, I think it was toward the beginning, but he was explaining gravity 
And as he explained gravity, he went back into explaining it like a middle school science teacher would. And so he was trying to be very basic because a lot of the readers may not quite understand it. And so I thought that that was a really good approach by the author to make it in that voice, so to speak. The whole idea of the spin drives igniting the atmosphere. I think was a real stumbling block for trying to retrieve things in that atmosphere because all of their propulsion methods would immediately ignite the atmosphere. Even when they were dropping their fishing line down or the, the chain of xenonite, they had to maintain a specific angle so as to not burn up the xenonite and yet not ignite the atmosphere while maintaining enough speed to not be brought down by gravity. There was kind of a lot going on in this chapter. And then everything goes poorly, right? Yeah. From they've lowered the probe down, they've captured the atmosphere, they've brought it back up, things go bad. There's an unknown force as they're leaving the atmosphere that is now pushing them. They think they should be in zero G, but they're not. An unaccountable force that is exerting itself on the ship somehow and it's revealed that the fuel tank has a leak. The hull of the ship, the fuel tanks were, were breached a little bit, and they're, they're leaking astrophage out of one of the tanks. And of course, they kind of have a double-hulled ship, so they have like the living quarters inside, and then they're surrounded by the astrophage fuel, and then there's the outer hull. So there don't seem to be serious breaches in the inner hull, but in the outer hull. I yep. really enjoyed um, near the end of chapter 19. That's where the thrust is from. Trillions and trillions of horny little astrophages all ready to breathe. <laughs> then all at once they see Adrian, not just a source of carbon dioxide, but their ancestral homeland, the planet they evolved over billions of years to seek out. The astrophage now see Adrian's atmosphere and zoop, that's where they're heading to. They go out one way, it pushes the rocket ship the other way, and they start spinning. The spinning pins Ryland against his control panel. Rocky leaves his environment, pulls the chair off of Ryland, has this near-death experience because now he's in an oxygen environment and being as hot as he is. He incinerates the radiator on his back. This is a bad thing, right? Because that's where chapter 19 ends, is uh, Rylan going out and seeing that Rocky has exited his area to save him. A little bit earlier in the chapter, there's a bit of foreshadowing where Rocky was thrown around a little bit and Grace sees a little bit of his silver blood. And so I think that that helps us getting to the next chapter when Rocky is sick and Rocky's hurt and he has to save him. And so I thought that just the fact that he mentioned this silver blood was something that was a bit of foreshadow. And the other thing that I thought was interesting at the end, for people who don't understand the phrase mechanical suffocation, which he uses in there, he makes the connection. It's it's kind of like a boa constrictor. And I think even if we've never seen a boa constrictor in person, most people know what boa constrictors are. And so that's a way that the author is connecting with the readers, whether they're at a high level or a low level in terms of their background knowledge. Chapter 20 continues the situation where Ryland's not sure if Rocky is still alive or if he's actually dead. He manages to get Rocky back into his own environment. And as he does that, the hot ammonia environment blasts him through the door just as he shuts it. And it now sears his arm, gives him damage. And so now the ship has been wounded. Rocky has been wounded. Ryland has been wounded. This is the second act of the three-act play where everybody starts taking their hits. Things don't look so good. You're wondering if they're going to be able to make it out of this. One thing that I'll say at the beginning of this in my notes, I wrote, a bunch of math I don't understand um, <laughs> as he was explaining stuff. And so, you know, again, this is the thing is, is I'm not a scientist and I'm not a math person, but I still relate to this. And sometimes I just kind of say, well, you know, I guess I don't quite get this, but that's all right. I don't, I don't, I don't need to understand everything that's going on. Related to that, the whole concept of oxidation, you know, where the soot forms and that's a primary thing we talk about in chemistry all the time. When Ryland sees that Rocky's radiators are filled with black soot, his natural reaction, and I think ours would be too, is to find a way to blow that black soot out of there. And so he devises this little box and he puts a, a little 
gas nozzle in there and he aims it just right and he's able to blow all the black soot off of Rocky, uh, hopefully to save him, right? That's his intent. And his logic as he's explaining why he wanted to blow off this black soot makes sense because that's our experience too, right? If you see something like that, it's that's clogging an air filter, you want to blow that soot off of the air filter. It's not until later in chapter 21 that we realize that wasn't such a good move. So in chapter 21, this is our first flashback that we get in this sequence of chapters. And it's Rylan sitting down with the three crew astronauts to ask them, how do they want to die? And he has to categorize each one. And each of the three has a very interesting answer. I really like the idea of the nitrogen asphyxiation. That mm -hmm. one made a lot of sense to me in terms of wearing the EVA suit, removing the carbon dioxide, which causes the pain. I thought that was very like, yeah, they gave it serious thought, which they should. And of course, Yao wants a gun brought along, partly because he's the leader. And in case they have difficulties with either of the other methods, he's like willing to take the responsibility to dispatch the rest of the crew. He kind of wants a worst case scenario kind of backup that could take care of everything if necessary. Like a kind of old fashioned sort of like can't possibly fail type of approach if they lose their nitrogen tanks or whatever, or leaks or something. Yeah, a universal lethal technique. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, uh, one of the last things you want to have on a spacecraft would be a gun. If uh, you you shot a hole, yeah. hull, that wouldn't help. Uh, that would actually be pretty bad. So that was just one thing that I responded to, or that I thought of. Um, but also with the whole thing with the heroin overdose, it wasn't, I want it all at once. It was, well, I want to try it. I want to enjoy it first. And then maybe a little bit more, then maybe a little bit more. And then you can go ahead and give me the, the lethal dose. I really enjoyed Rylan and Rocky are talking about evolution. And they start asking, why do we hear the same frequencies? Why do we think the same speed? This was a very interesting conversation. What did you guys think about that? I liked their conversation. I don't know if I ended up agreeing with their result, though. I mean, I guess I, I partially agreed that it had to do with predator survival and that there were certain noises made. But it turns out that the noises that they reference are actually broadband noises that actually make sound all the way from low frequencies to very high frequencies. Any kind of like a scraping or anything like that makes a very broadband sort of noise. So you could be sensitive just about anywhere and they could still be exclusive and you still would likely be able to hear it. My thoughts were that they're the same size. You know, like they're roughly the same size organism. Um, I mean, even if we're to consider like a mouse and a human, we're on sort of the same scale compared to like a bacteria or a moon or something like that, you know, and that that size scale kind of sets the operation of the organ that is used to receive sound. Um, for example, like uh, your, your ear canal functions like a musical instrument's air column, and it has its own most sensitive frequencies, your ear canal. And that most sensitive frequency, just based on your ear canal being about, I don't know, like an inch or so long, is like 3000 hertz. So that means that our ear just at that stage is like most sensitive right around 3000 hertz. If we were way bigger and we had way bigger ear canals, then the sounds we would be sensitive to would be quite a bit different. For any organism that has like a, a sensory organ that's on that scale, that's going to determine like sort of the center of your um, of your sort of hearing frequency. And it turns out that human hearing is most sensitive to 1000 to 4000 hertz, right where our ear canal is most sensitive. This is why I love the common read. I don't know anything about sound and frequency. <laughs> and you just explained this. And so you're teaching me about something. And so I, I, that's what I love about this. You know, Sonia with her chemistry and Wade talking about math and, and some science fiction and, and stuff like that. I mean, this is, this is where it's at. That's, that's why I love this common read stuff. Yeah. I thought this book was a good pick for having a lot of different opportunities like that. Maybe a little science heavy, but still something that I think everyone has some appeal to. We return back to the Hail Mary. 
We crack open the device that collected the sample. Ryland puts it on a slide and he discovers that it's teeming with life, that there's all sorts of little critters in this sample of atmosphere from Adrian. And they're watching it and they notice that there's a, this amoeba-like creature that surrounds an astrophage and destroys it. And they label this Tau Amoeba. Uh, tau because it's from the star Tau Ceti. Amoeba because it looks like an amoeba. And so now they've discovered that they have Tau Amoeba. Things are looking good. We've got this new character to now talk about in addition to astrophage, Tau Amoeba. What did you think of this? I kept on waiting for, how are we going to treat this problem we have on Earth? So I was waiting for something like this. It's kind of funny to have such a unsuspecting hero. You know, like it's just this little glob that's sitting on a glass slide and it's going to be the savior of these two planets. Well, it's funny that you should characterize Tau Miba as a hero and a savior because yeah. immediately upon discovering Tau Miba, the mm -hmm. power goes out because yeah. it gets into the astrophage fuel tanks and eats all the atmosphere. So we talked about this on the last yeah. podcast where we have this duality of astrophage. You know, in one point, it's going to be the source of the earth going into this, you know, cold zone. It's eating up the sun and the weather patterns and all that. On the other hand, it's the hero because you're using it as a propulsion method to get to Tau Ceti and you're using it to insulate the ship from dangerous radiation. Now we're seeing the same duality with Tau Miba, where the Tau Miba at first is the savior because it can eat astrophage. It's also the villain because it eats astrophage. You need to watch what you wish for. The power gets cut off to the Hail Mary. Ryland gets into the fuel line, opens it up, and there's this goo. That's... Tau Miba poop. Yes, Tau Miba poop that is in the fuel line. And then he realizes that the Tau Miba got into the fuel line, ate all the astrophage, and they don't have any fuel. They are dead in the water. They don't have any fuel for their engines to power the ship. They don't have any fuel for their generators to generate electricity for the ship. And so things are not looking good. The fact that he uses that phrase Tau Miba poop it fits in with his whole character that he doesn't really swear very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's this middle school teacher. Poop is definitely a middle school word. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> Ryland remembers they have the beetles that are independently fueled. And so they are going to affix three of the beetles to the exterior of the Hail Mary, use remote controls to power the three beetles and thereby powering the Hail Mary back to the blip A, where Rocky has a lot of astrophage in reserve. So now in chapter 23, the Hail Mary is on its way to the blip A, and we have a series of flashbacks. We learn that the explosion that killed Dubois and the backup astronaut uh, was caused by an error in the lab. Where they made the difference was a nanogram and a milligram. So a milla, you can actually see about one little tiny speck on one of the analytical balances I have, which might be about one milligram. A nanogram is a million times smaller, and there's no way you can actually visualize that with the human eye. So that is a huge difference in mass. Joe, you would probably agree that every calculation ever made should include units and margin of error. Yep. Unit mismatches that have plowed uh, actual spacecraft into the moon when they were not supposed to because there was poor communication between different teams. Other surprises that have occurred because units aren't, aren't shared properly or aren't calculated properly. Even though you're talking about things that you may or may not be able to see once you throw that tiny mass into E equals MC squared, yeah. you realize what a large energy difference that is. It's a million times, like she said. As a result of this explosion and the death of Dubois, Strat strongly urges Ryland to volunteer to take Dubois' position as the science engineer on the Hail Mary. He doesn't want to do it. He wants to stay on earth, be there for his kids, he calls them, right? These are all the, the students that he's taught. She wants him to do it. She says, 
We don't have time to train someone else. We could bring somebody in, but they're not going to be as good as you. And we are under a time crunch here to get this done. You're the best person for the job. Do it. And he says no. And this is where I think we get, you know, Strat as this third most important character or more, most intriguing character, I think, in the book. Uh, right after the explosion happens, Strat is like, okay, Grace, I want you to figure out who the next person should be to fill the spot. And Grace responds with, are you made of stone or something? And so she is just has ice water going through her veins. She's got on a mission and she's not going to let anything stand in her way. And so she straight arms Grace into, you know, participating and drugs him. Uh, and we find out why eventually at the end of the chapter, we find out why he had that amnesia and he slowly was able to remember things. That was a really good reveal. As I'm reading through this chapter, I'm thinking, oh, this is how he becomes. And he volunteers and he gets on the ship and away he goes. And it takes this left turn where Grace says, I don't want to go. And they have this head to head. And then you find out that, yes, Strat drugged him and then gave him amnesia medication. And that's why he couldn't remember anything at the beginning of the book. It fit the character for Strat as well, because like ever since the beginning, she's clearly been able to, or been willing to break every rule and just burn everything down in order to fulfill the specific task that she's been given. So it's no surprise that she would do something like that. Uh, the ends justify the means for her. So she's very, do I dare say, Machiavellian. This was part of that evolutionary talk that we alluded to a little bit earlier. Why are they willing to sacrifice themselves for the entire species? Self-sacrifice doesn't seem to be a very good transferable evolutionary trait. Rocky made a comment about how they're both good guys. They're doing what's best for the species self-sacrificing themselves to go on this mission. They're part of social species, you know, and not all animals are. It, it, it may not make strategic sense for a tiger to do that, but for an ant or a bee or a human, then it, it does because we see our entire species as a sort of organism, you know, and sacrificing an individual for that organism um, may make more strategic sense for a, a social species. The last chapter in the series is chapter 24. We're almost back to the blip A, and Ryland is evolving Taumiba. They've discovered that Taumiba does not handle nitrogen very well. And so the plan is speeding up the evolutionary process to create a more nitrogen resistant version of Taumiba. Venus has 3.5% nitrogen. And Three World, which is Rocky's homeworld, has 8% nitrogen. And we need the Taumiba to survive in those conditions in order to eat astrophage and save the star. Sonia, do you have any insight as to why the author would choose to make Taumiba nitrogen resistant as opposed to maybe oxygen resistant or carbon resistant or some other element? Why pick nitrogen? the nitrogen molecule itself is a triple bond. It has the most energy and it's the shortest bond and it's the most stable to us. I mean, we're breathing in 78% nitrogen. I got to jump in here. I said uh, there was a bunch of math I didn't understand. Well, this is a bunch of science, um, <laughs> but, but it's all good. It's all good. I kind of agree with Sonia that it kind of seems like it was probably supposed to be a surprise that it's something that just about everyone knows is around and innocuous, like nitrogen. There really is no, no particular risk to it generally. So it's a surprise that the Talmiba would be, would be susceptible to it. It's just one more hurdle that the author had to throw in our hero's journey. First, the engines have to go. We got to get rid of the engines. We got to give everybody injuries, mm -hmm. near-death experiences. And now the solution will react fatally with a very common element, nitrogen, that we all kind of take for granted. What else could go wrong? We finally get the solution and no, now guess what? It won't survive on the planet that we need it to survive on. And I think this gets to the writing aspect of the book. You always want to create conflict 
And a lot of times the conflict makes you, as a reader, you're like, oh gosh, what's going to end up happening here? Oh, I want to keep reading or I want to continue to watch a show. At the end of maybe an episode of Stranger Things, you're wondering you're at a cliffhanger or something like that. And so there's conflict followed by another conflict, followed by another and another, and it becomes more and more complex over time in many cases. And it is a little bit convenient that these conflicts seem to occur when we have a long period of travel. Like they just happen to have three weeks to oh, travel yeah. from one ship to the other, and they have enough time to run all these experiments. Pop culture references or favorite quotes. At one point he says, I need to play Lava Floor uh, as he's traveling through the ship. And so I, all kids end up playing that. Um, he makes a reference to the Poseidon adventure and being upside down. I suspect that many of our students will be unfamiliar with the film, the Poseidon adventure. It was a popular film, but from almost 50 years ago. My students today in lab, the importance of sleep, and they all understood what being stupid tired means. When they're talking about the evolution, Ryland was talking to Rocky about how smart Rocky is because he can do this math really fast. And Rocky says, math is not thinking. Math is procedure. Mm -hmm. Memory is not thinking. Memory is storage. And, and the first one, math is not thinking. Math is procedure. Like, I, I hate to admit that, but really, once you've carved a path on how to do something mathematically, it becomes an algorithm. And so you can program an algorithm that will take an input, do all of the arithmetic steps and produce an output. A lot of mathematics is kind of like that. We're using the word math in a very broad case. There are areas of math where you do an incredible amount of thinking and you are carving your own path. And if you've never seen something before, like completing the square in a quadratic equation, this is a new path for you and it is learning. You, you do have to do some type of a learning there or, or you have to do some type of thinking to recognize, okay, this is how we would solve this type of problem. But the quote, math is not thinking, math is procedure. Memory is not thinking, memory is storage. If you think about a lot of the assessment models that we use, we're testing people's memory. Can you recall what this formula is? Can you recall what this term is labeled? Can you recall when this war occurred and what parties fought in that war? I jumped right to logic from what you were talking about. And I was reading this because this is how we develop problem solving skills and critical thinking is through the logic of understanding and applying the math or the yep. engineering skills that Rocky had. I mean, we, we talk a lot about AI right now. You know, and I think I think kind of AI is oversold a little bit to the extent that it really is advanced algorithms, like it's really advanced computation. It goes through storage, like Rocky says, like it uses other resources and it just kind of like smashes stuff together to um, have an algorithm try to fit a solution to a specific prompt. But it really isn't any type of actual intelligence that can contribute something new or truly critical. It is just something that chops up stuff that's already out there and kind of gives it back to try to address the prompt. I think there's still a gulf between an actual critical creative intelligence and what AI is able to actually do right now. Superficially, in some circumstances, it can look like a quite a bit like a critical creative intelligence, but it really is limited by the way that it's programmed and the resources that it has access to. You've been listening to The Fox Den, a podcast series from West Shore Community College. This has been our review of the winter 2023 book of the semester, Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir, chapters 19 through 24. Join us in two weeks for our final review of chapters 25 through 30. Until then, I'm Wade James. And I'm Mike Nagel. And I'm Sonia Seward. And I'm Joe Husky. Fifty's a number. Did I say 23? Aye, aye, aye. Horny little astrophages. Third time is the charm here, right? I'm going to edit that part out.